everybody's conversations, and I know many people are still getting their food. Worry not, there are plenty of seats, and uh, you will be able to hear while you serve yourself. But my colleague Gabriel Kahn is pointing out that we have four presenters, and we have only an hour, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm Geneva Oberholzer, I'm the director of the Journalism School, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Director's Forum. We do this every Tuesday. We gather and we have an interesting speaker or two. Today, we have an interesting selection of our own colleagues, and to introduce them, I'll present my colleague, Gabriel Kahn, who's on the journalism faculty and a leader here in both media, economics, and entrepreneurship, and also in the Annenberg Innovation Lab. Very good. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, today, we're going to have, we're going to hear uh, from people who are working on four separate projects that are kind of incubating within the Annenberg Innovation Lab. Uh, so this is just an opportunity to see some of the work that they're doing, and also really kind of an advertisement, I hope, to all of you to uh, kind of investigate opportunities uh, at the Innovation Lab that, uh, that are there. Uh, this is really the place where you can turn, I think, some of the challenges that we see in journalism today, in public relations, et cetera, into opportunities. Uh, this is a wonderful place also to kind of take communication skills and uh, journalistic skills and work with uh, engineers, computer programmers, and things like that to really kind of expand the horizons of what we can do with communication. Uh, so we're going to do this uh, pretty rapidly for all four presenters, not quite sort of Petra Kucha pace, but uh, very quickly. And then we're going to uh, hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Our first uh, presenter here is Andrew Lee. So. Uh, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Lee. I'm an associate professor here at USC. Welcome all our prospective students. Um, my last name is Lee, even though it looks like an N. I wish I could piggyback on the Lynn sanity, but it's uh, <laughs> not to be. But let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing here with video training. Um, and this is the big question that this answers, is why is video training, teaching and learning, that is, so hard? And 10 years of training journalists and students over the years, I found this is the toughest thing to teach journalists, is how to do visual storytelling and visual uh, journalism in a coherent way. So what are some of the problems that we have with teaching video journalism? Well, number one is that everyone thinks they know how to shoot video, so they do what we call the Uncle Murray um, birthday party video, right? You want to capture everything that's in the room, you move the camera around, but this usually winds up with unusable footage. Right? It's not usable in storytelling sense. You can get a sense that this is uh, a birthday party, but there's not really a story there. So what are some of the things that we see with journalists and trying to teach students how to do video journalism? Well, there's bad framing. There's not enough close-ups in terms of video shooting. Um, and the inability to shoot sequences. Anything more than a 30-second video story, you really want to have sequences. It's like trying to write a, a story with all declarative sentences. You need some variation in what's going on. So what are some other reasons why this is so hard to teach this to journalism students and journalists? Well, one is that we're increasingly asking journalists to do more, right? Report with a notebook, take pictures, record audio, do video. So multitasking is really quite tough to get all these things done in one shot. The technical tools to do this are pretty complex. You know, the camera back there on the tripod, which we give to students, has a lot of things. Zoom, record, aperture, shutter, all these different things make it a pretty tough thing to handle. Um, the intrusiveness of video reporting. This is something that a lot of students have a tough time doing. Instead of sitting back and taking notes, you've got to get in people's faces and take video. So that's a big um, social barrier to get, get over. And there's also a very slow feedback loop in terms of what you learn shooting in the field, coming back to try to edit and realize what you've done wrong, and sometimes you don't get a second chance to shoot that video footage again. Right. So the idea here is that we really want to speed up the process of learning video because one of the big weaknesses that we have in training students is that we can teach folks how to do research beforehand, we can teach students how to do editing, but when they're out there shooting in the field, you're on your own. There's no instructor next to you, all the mistakes are your own, and you have to live with them. So what if we could, in fact, solve this problem? Now we're seeing more motivations for this as well. There's more and more companies going out there creating iPhone apps or applications where they're asking citizen journalists to create video for us. Right? Um, so some examples of this are oops, that, CNN iReport, uh, Raw Porter, Videolicious, and even Wikipedia, which has this wiki news arm, is asking for ordinary folks to go out there and capture video that can be put in the encyclopedia. So one interesting case is Videolicious. If anyone has seen this app on iPad or iPhone, um, it's basically a partnership with a lot of lifestyle brands to actually ask people to send in videos related to that brand. So one good example is Martha Stewart. If you use their app, Martha asks you, what is, 
what is it that makes you most like Martha? And you're supposed to submit your video to this. Um, yeah. So the problem is that they give you this very long, complex text description of what they want you to shoot video of. Are you going to do that? Probably not. Right? So you're asked to do a video task, but they're not giving you video instructions to do that. The idea is to marry these two things together. Another example that just came up recently is a little app called Raw Porter. Some people have critiqued it, saying, you know, it's a nice idea, but poor execution. So we really have this need for creating good tools that allow us to do good video capture in the field. Um, so, you know, my expertise is in Wikipedia and how people create content online together. So Wiki started out to share programming patterns, and I said, what if we looked at the Wiki as a way to share video patterns online? So here at Annenberg and a lot of other journalism schools, um, there's a BBC, BBC five-shot method that we use to teach video journalism. It was pioneered by Michael Rosenblum, who brought it to New York Times Television, to New York One, to BBC, to Current TV Today. And it's a very simple method which gives people a pattern on how to shoot video. And he basically says, forget everything you know about video journalism. You should always start off stories with these five shots. Okay? Always start with a close-up of the hands, a close-up of the face, a wide shot, an over-the-shoulder shot, and then an unusual shot to close the scene. And so some people look at this and say, that sounds way too rigid for my tastes. But in general, it has worked quite well. So here's an example of how that works. Okay, a close-up on the hands gets you into the action very quickly. A close-up on the face tells you who's doing this action. A wide shot tells you where this is happening. And then a sh over the shoulder shots links all three concepts together, hands, motion, and the environment. And then the fifth shot kind of closes the scene with additional information on what's going on. Okay, so very simple template, has trained a lot of journalists over the years, but even with this method, there are some shortcomings in terms of how quickly you can train journalists. We have actually streamlined this so that we have a five-shot checklist that we give students in the field to actually use while they're shooting video. So it starts with the best shots and gets audience, audiences to ask questions. What's going on? Who's doing it? Where are they doing it? How are they doing it? And why it works is because this sequence always cuts together logically in the editor. You can put these five shots together, narrate on top of it, and it makes complete sense to the viewer. Right? So we get usable B-roll or secondary footage all the time with this. And the mystery of these close-ups bring people in, which is a big problem when you're trying to train journalists how to shoot good video. What's the difference between amateurs and professionals? Pros shoot visual sequences. Amateurs don't. So how do we get folks to that pro level very quickly? Okay. So it compels journalists to get close. We found this with students. It gets them really close to the subject matter uh, faster than they normally would. Uh, gets over their shyness very quickly. So what we've done is we put this into a checklist with a lot of hints for students. But you can see this is a lot to digest in the field. And what happens is you wind up with students like this. A checklist in one hand, a camera in the other. And it's a lot of work going back and forth. Right? So what if you could marry these two things together into one device? Right? So this is where we start to think about how this reinvents the textbook, right? We're used to a textbook as being something that you read that has text and photos. We might even have an e-textbook that can play audio and video back to you, but it doesn't do anything to help you work on a project. And what we're reconceiving now is the idea of an e-workbook. So imagine your iPad is not just something where you browse stuff, but you're actually using the camera on the back inside a textbook environment to capture stuff. And that's what we're working on right now. So instead of paper instruction, build the five-shot method into the device. The iPad is a ridiculously big screen here. Anyone who's ever used the camera on this, you get a little seasick, right? Because it's a gigantic video on there. And you actually don't need that much space. So what can you put around it that can help? So we're prototyping a lot of different ways of using the iPad as an assistant for shooting video. So you can have the video being previewed in this little window, but you can also have the checklist next to you on the same interface that you're shooting the video on. On top of that, what if you can go in there and you have this checklist that you can actually go through each video shot that you just took and make sure that you captured those right elements, right? So is it a mysterious shot? Are you getting close enough? The hand should be about 50% of the frame. And with algorithms from Intel or other companies that have these ways to analyze video, you could even have the program say, well, you know, the hands are only 32% of the shot. Maybe you should get closer in there, right? So you have an assistant, an expert opinion right over your shoulder as you're shooting this. Another prototype for this might look like this, where you actually have the five shots lined up here. And as you take them, they fill in the film strip here. And you can kind of see your story being created in real time. And this is something that you really don't have with existing video cameras. They think about shots. They don't think about sequences. Right. So there's some very interested parties in this, a company called Vericorder, which creates a kit to convert your iPhone into a high-end video shooting solution, has shown a lot of interest in this. 
saying, you know, we have the hardware, but we really don't know how to get our users to shoot better video. And when they saw what we're doing with the five shot, they said, well, that's, that's great. So they started to do some of this training at Notre Dame, West Virginia, and WTOP, the radio station in DC, and they found that it resonated with journalists. And they're really looking forward to seeing what we come up with so that they can put this kind of software on their phones. So what are some of the challenges of creating this for launch for the public? Well, the big question right now is, you know, on an Apple platform, do we make it a book or do we make it an app? Because it's a hybrid of the two, right? So the thing that we've decided is that right now, if you look at some of these criteria in terms of do we want it to run on many devices or do we want it to run on just Apple devices? Do we want the text of this textbook to reflow or do we want it to be static? Do we want it to be an open standard or do we want it to be locked into Apple solution? But the more that we looked at this, there really is not a lot of options. We really do have to kind of go the Apple app way, right? Because eBooks right now don't have a lot of functionality other than showing you video and audio. If you actually want to do media capture, you really do have to make it into an app, which means it'll be listed in the Apple app store and not the bookstore. So we're seeing that the terminology we have, and even a progressive company like Apple still hasn't caught up to where we really want them to be. That if you put these two things together, it exists in just a store, not an app, not a bookstore, just a store, uh, generically. <laughs> so what are some other things that we want to do um, going forward? Um, some things that we want to do is inside the app, if you can edit and trim the clips and actually make a sequence that you can actually send to your instructor or your editor for evaluation. So before you leave the scene, your editor can look at it and say, okay, everything's a go, or go, can you go back and reshoot that because it's not usable unless you do that. And wouldn't it be great to have that feedback in the field before you go back to the newsroom? Uh, so the development state right now, we have example footage and the rubrics done. We have the video system that's being prototyped by our great developers in the innovation lab. We have an evaluation system uh, that we're designing right now in terms of how do we ship it to an editor and how do you ship the information back. And hopefully we'll have the prototype done this semester in spring. And uh, future work, what if it goes beyond five shots? What if the app is not just baked in with a five shot method, but you could have a generic system so that ABC could load their system, New York Times could say we want seven shots, or ABC News says we want four shots. And you could actually load your app with different types of styles. And that's something that would be a great extension to have. And then other algorithms for analyzing the clips and finding out better ways to shoot video. So that's it. I'm so just at 10 minutes. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Hold on. Really kind of revolutionizing the textbook, making it kind of a real living, interactive thing. Uh, you know, so many of the ebooks now are essentially books put on glass. Uh, this really kind of uh, takes that and expands the, uh, the possibilities tremendously. Uh, Kirsten Dorsen, uh, another professor at journalism school in the SPR program, uh, is going to talk about <clears throat> marrying a couple of different issues that we see now, the, the sort of power of gamification, uh, for lack of a better word, um, uh, the ability to engage uh, youth and the importance of engaging youth uh, in both politics and the political discussion and in journalism itself. So go ahead, Kirsten. Thank you. I'm, I'm totally going to use your minutes that you didn't use. Okay, so, so kick me if I don't want to get um, So what I want to talk to you about is a, is a, is a Drawing Democracy project, which is a, a big collaboration between um, a group of researchers, who you can see, um, several newspapers, the Kids Voting USA Civics Curriculum, which is a national civics curriculum, um, Sort of franchise system uh, throughout the country, and Upward Hub, which is a, a game design, an amazing little game design company. And just so you don't think I can draw, all the beautiful art that you see throughout here came from them, not from me. So it's, a, it's cool stuff. But the, the goal of the project is to experiment and innovate on ways to connect young people with news content, with an eye to political learning, to civic engagement, um, and particularly in election context. And what I'm going to show you today um, is the, the sort of initial more than initial planning stages on a social game, which is one of our first ways as part of this project we're thinking about innovating in this space. And, and this is a whole, the planning project was funded by the Innovation Lab, which we are very grateful for. Um, so <coughs> let, let me, let me, before I get to that, let me tell you a little bit about why do we need such a, why would we make some goofy social game to connect young people in the news? Um, because it's not 1963, all right? And I didn't put this here because of the funny hair, although, <laughs> 
the radical of Google Images from 1963, I don't recommend you go there, but it was not 1963. I picked the year because I recently discovered this amazing historical trove of survey data from 1963, a survey of high school students in 1963. And among many things, they asked these high school students about news consumption. 79% of high school students reported reading about politics, not just reading the newspaper, but reading about politics in the news more than three days a week. That's a lot. 70% reported watching the television news, watching politics on television news more than three days a week. Okay? This was an era of where news media was a habit. It was routine, it was part of everyday life. Um, and now I, I, wanna, I wanna flash forward to, to today, and the, the more tender-hearted among you may wish to close your eyes. This is from survey data we collected in 2008. Of high school students, 4% report reading a print newspaper more than three days a week. 17% report watching news on television more than three days a week. And before you say to me that's because they're all on the internet, 4% reported reading an online newspaper more than three days a week. And, and this number is for online newspapers. The numbers hold for the websites of TV news organizations, for um, political blogs, for all the sort of authoritative-ish news sources that you can think of online, right? So we think this is a pretty big problem, um, particularly because this number back here, this, these 70% numbers, they're still true of those people, right? So if you go look at survey data of people who are, you know, graduated from high school in the early to mid 60s, they're still consuming news content at these rates, right? Like 70, 65, 70% rates, which means that there's some possibility that these numbers may hold. They may not grow as these young people get older. So what happened? Um, there's a lot of stories you can tell, but overall, in general, we find that Young people today do not find mainstream news. Obviously, you guys accept it because welcome. We're really good. <laughs> 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 um, but the, for, for many young people, they don't find mainstream traditional news content particularly appealing. And when you ask them, they tend to say that they don't think that keeping up with the news is a necessary part of life, or even an obligation that they feel like they need to fulfill. So news content is becoming a little less appealing for whatever reason. At the same time, of course, as you know, there's been a proliferation of media, which means at any given moment, if your eyeballs want to be reading something or watching something, you don't need to look at news content at 530, right? There's 100 channels, not three or four or two, right? So you've got a lot more options. Overall, what does this mean? The news as habit era, right, as you know, has been replaced by the news on demand era, which is awesome if you demand it. But what we're finding is that the demand, the level of demand for news content, at least as we traditionally thought about it, is very low among our young citizens. And there's a lot of competition for So this is a problem for a lot of people. If you're a news organization, obviously that's a problem. Um, but it's also a problem if you care about, you know, like democracy. Because we can think about this as a breakdown of a certain kind of civic infrastructure. And I'm not saying it was the world's most awesome civic infrastructure. Like, it was not the only way to make sure people get informed. It's not the only way for news content to be out there in the world. But it was a way we understood, right? News content came from out here, and it trickled down. And for most people, under most circumstances, they were exposed to at least a little bit of it, right? That's not true anymore. The best we can tell you from tons of research about news media exposure is that it's massively contingent on who you are. <laughs> if you're interested, if you care, there is more news than you've ever seen in the world. But if you're not interested and you don't care, it's increasingly easy to isolate yourself from informational content altogether. And I can tell you that young people are not that interested. So what do we do? Right? The question becomes, how do we infuse news content back into these social networks that are increasingly increasingly <coughs> poor in informational content? So we think we should experiment with it. Let's make stuff, let's study stuff, I'm a researcher, let's find out stuff, let's think about new ways to do it. And one way we think is important is to think about creating spaces to infuse news content that are social and that are fun. And we're inspired very much um, by research that comes from here, from uh, our Henry Jenkins, from Aaron Riley, the Innovation Lab, looking at ideas about participatory learning. Maybe young, young people want to get information content in a sort of a fundamentally different way than those people who graduated in 1963. So our first stab at what we're developing now is um, drawing democracy. And it's a social game, which means it's not a video game, it's not a board game. <laughs> It's integrated with Facebook, it's online, but it gets you into offline spaces in a lot of different ways that I'll show you. Um, and it's a partnership between news organizations and the classroom. It's, a, it's designed to create infrastructure where it's gone, right? It's designed to create a conduit between news organizations and classrooms. And why classrooms? <coughs> Let's 
classrooms because it's the one place that's not interest driven. You go there because you have to, right? Not because you're interested in the news. You go there because you have to. And so for many young people, that's the only place you get civics. It's the only place that you get news from. Right? So I think it's really important to get into, into those spaces. And drawing democracy um, at its heart is a narrative about this girl. Her name is, her name is Chuck. Um, <laughs> I think she's cool. I'm told she's cool. You ask prompted. I would be, right? Okay, so she's a, um, she's a fictional character. She's a blogger and she's a young artist. And the narrative of the game is that she's trying to make sense of a lot of what's going on. And keep in mind, this is a game that runs over the course of a whole election cycle. Okay? So through her blog, you get is the entry point sort of into the game space. She blogs a lot, she interacts, you're allowed to interact with her in a whole bunch of different ways. And also, her blog posts, as well as news content, as well as the civics curriculum, inspire a series of missions. And the missions, this is just one example, there's, well, I'll leave that up in a second. Um, the missions ask you to, to make stuff, right? This is about shooting video, it's about, not, not good, not good video, <laughs> crappy video. This is about shooting video and taking pictures however you want. Um, uh, some of the missions ask you to go to a community <coughs> meeting or shoot someone, shoot video of someone on the street or to use your cell phone to capture yourself debating with a friend over something, um, to use video to remix debates, various different things. And throughout the mission spaces, and there's lots of different kinds of missions, the whole space is infused with news content. And I, and I say infused on purpose because it's not just like, here is a news story, you will now read it. It's that the news stories that come from our partner organizations are there for lots of different reasons. They provide the context for the mission. Sometimes they are the missions. Um, sometimes they're extra resources for the mission. And they're tagged and they're always there linked back out to the custom news sites that our partner organizations are making. They're there if you want to go deeper. So if something in there sparks that interest or you find that moment of relevancy, we create a space for you to dig deeper by going further into the news site. Once you've done a mission, um, you've created something, right? There's an artifact. And in order to complete your mission and get your points, it's a game after all, and it's a competition. In order to earn your points, you have to upload your mission. And here you start to see in these mock-ups um, the really social part of the game. Because when you submit stuff, and when there is stuff submitted, the game is designed to produce interactions around the stuff, right? Like, sounds like a cliche now, right? It's a social game. It sounds a little cliche, but it is, right? It's connected to Twitter. It's connected to Facebook. And the, the, the philosophy here is that you don't make new spaces for people to go. You take your stuff, your new stuff, and you make it in a way that people can take it into their own spaces and let it spread through their own spaces. So you can do that. You can um, vote stories up. You can uh, share share stories, share mission content, um, and like it to various ways. And so the other cool part about this is that Again, it's connected back to the news organizations, right? Because the game is creating content, right? Not traditional news content, not like story content, but it's creating content. It's content that the newspaper partners are really excited about putting on their website, about broadcasting to a, the broader audience, which is their community, right? And really seeing the game ecosystem is extending beyond just this classroom <coughs> partnership between sort of the broader community in various ways. Okay. So of course, it's a game you can teach. You can compete against other people. You can compete, um, your school can compete against other schools. And the cities where we're piloting the program, you can compete against each other as well. And then, this is just kind of a visual picture of the ecosystem. And I, and I, like, I like the visual because I really am convinced that what we need to be experimenting with is creating spaces that mediate again between news organizations and young people. Because the ones we have, which were habit and subscription don't work anymore, right? So how can we create interesting spaces that allow young people to see the connection between their own lives and politics and news content um, in ways that aren't happening right now? And then finally, you can do whatever you want with the game, which we think is cool, because it's early on when we were talking to our news partners, they were like, oh yeah, cool, okay, yeah, we'll try that, especially if you mostly pay for it. And you know, like, we'll try that, and that's a great idea, but why just for young people? And why just for the election? Why can't we use this? And, and we think, that if this works, that it can be a broader idea for a platform for community engagement, right? That, that there's no reason that things that newspapers are already doing, like having scavenger hunts or <coughs> caption contests or, you know, compete over crossword puzzles, that those kinds of things can be wrapped into a broader narrative that produces loyalty and engagement over time. 
Um, and because we're giant nerds and it's inspired by research, <laughs> we care if it works or not, right? I'm a full-time skeptic. This game stuff, I really hope it works, and I hope all the enthusiasm over, just make it fun, it's good, I hope that's true. But we're gonna find out, right? It's really important to us that we designed a game that is really good at measuring itself. So we know when a news story enters the news ecosystem, what happens to it? Which stories do people read? Which ones inspire engagement and which ones don't? Which ones travel and which ones don't, right? Which ones make sense for people? And, and how do students differ in the way that they engage and interact with various kinds of content? Oh, and we'll also do more sort of traditional research and survey research and really trying to understand the impact of, of this of this interface. <coughs> so thanks for listening. We oh I should say this. This is all a PowerPoint. This is all a PowerPoint, right? So we're in the process. We're in the process of trying to fund to do um, to do a real prototype to, to pilot this in the fall because we're really excited about it. Um, but right now, you know, what we have are wireframes, which, which is, you know, in arts, which is awesome, and we're really excited. I think also to have your feedback because we're still at a stage where we can do anything with this project. So thank you so much, and thank you to Innovation Lab. <laughs> Of, of creating a new ecosystem for uh, news consumption, but also news engagement, which I think is, is, is so crucial. Uh, so, you know, one problem that I think so many of us have now as we try to navigate this uh, landscape of possibilities um, in news gathering, news consumption, et cetera, is that it changes so fast. It becomes so difficult to keep uh, pace with that. Uh, and we need something to kind of help us um, sort of uh, navigate that and, and kind of uh, understand what's out there for us. So that's what Robert's project is about. Hello. Um, so my project is a small little project that's aimed to solve two questions. Uh, first, let me ask, who is a fellow nerd or geek in the room? And by that, I mean chances are someone in your family asks you to fix their computer or asks a question of what's the cool app? I mean, what is Google Plus? Have you ever heard of Google Hangouts? What do we do there? SoundCloud? As a nerd, I know Andrew gets this too, and other nerds, we get hit up this question all the time. And in journalism, uh, technology exists but isn't primarily made for journalists. So the specialty I have or one of is to hijack technology in the name of journalism. And I get all these questions. What's a good uh, timeline tool? Where can I go to do data visualization? 360 VR, can I do it on my phone? What about a live shot? Uh, one day I'm going to get a question, is when can I uh, do a BBC, BBC Five shot on my tablet? <laughs> All these different questions that I get that uh, I decided years ago to create a page that collected a bunch of stuff. Now, literally, it's a bunch of technology that I present to my students uh, to do multimedia storytelling in class. In fact, I'm going to brag a little bit. Uh, the exhibit that you see on this floor is from my undergrad students doing multimedia storytelling on different communities around campus. Um, and many of them uh, know this term of, I want you to tell me a good story, it's got to have text, it's got to have video, it's got to have audio and pictures, but give me something webby. And they're like, what is webby? <laughs> webby is everything that is awesome of the web. Um, and this is the page that I point people to. Uh, the short URL is bit.ly slash tech and tools. And this is uh, something that, I, I'm going to use bus terms, I uh, aggregate and curate. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's the stuff that I nerd, about, uh, nerd out on and collect and tell other journalists uh, to use. So it's just a ran almost random collection of different technologies. Augmented reality, has anyone heard of augmented reality? Google goggles? Google is allegedly uh, going to start selling uh, over-the-head uh, glasses that have augmented reality built into them by the end of this year. Uh, Terminator, when he's searching for uh, Sarah Connor, <laughs> that's my analogy for augmented reality. So it's real life augmented by digital life. That's out there. One of the apps is Erasma. Uh, there's stuff for audio, how to edit audio through your browser, how can you post audio from your phone onto a website, live shots. Uh, maps, all this great stuff that is just spread out on the internet and no one really kind of has and sees that I go and I collect and put here. Um, but I put here, this is just a flat page with some jQuery for the nice effect that I give you a generic category and link to the site and an example of how to use it. 
Sometimes these companies don't have uh, a viable business plan and they die, but that's kind of like something I keep in the archive to remember that something else might come and replace it. Uh, but that's where this project came from. I get asked all the time of like, what's a cool app that you're using? What's a great technology that you use? I'm looking to do a story about the history of this <coughs> neighborhood. What, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a designer, what's out there? So I point them to this. For this project though, uh, I wanted to make this crowdsourced searchable database that allowed everyone to rate things. Um, and I was looking at three different sites out there that I'm kind of hijacking as influencers. <coughs> the first is the Carnival of Journalism. Has anyone ever heard of that? Yay, two people. <laughs> uh, basically, it's a bunch of bloggers that come together once a month to uh, riff on a topic about journalism. So you put a topic out there. Um, one topic was, can a journalist really be a capitalist? Um, what is uh, web video? Uh, what is web video? What is web journalism video? Um, what is life balance between the constant of technology and life? All these different abstract the kind of themes that get thrown out there and the community comes together and blogs about it. Everyone interprets the question their own way, comes up with their own answer and they put it out there. Um, that is specifically for journalism and I took them as an influence uh, in terms of putting something out there and getting the community once a month to come together and essentially generate content by tapping into that collective experience. Wisdom of the crowd. The other example is interactive narratives. Has anyone ever heard of that? It was big some years ago. Uh, Andrew Devagal, he is the head of multimedia at uh, the New York Times, formerly of San Francisco State. Uh, that's actually where he started this, which was a database of this multimedia stuff. But we didn't know what it was. This was a site dedicated to collecting multimedia stuff. And you would go there, and if I worked on a project like Main Street LA, I can upload it and people can take a look at it, see different things, people can rate it, people can comment on it. The Online News Association uh, took it over, but it's really not put a lot of attention to it, kind of died, hence the broken script over there in the corner. Uh, but it was the only place where you can see examples of diverse multimedia stories uh, to kind of get inspiration to see what's been done, things like that. And then the last inspiration is from uh, something on, uh, well, another company, but Beta List. Uh, has anyone ever heard of that? So there are so many freaking apps and tools and sites and products that are launching. That Beta List is a simple blog. I shared this with somebody who thanked me the last the next time I saw him, saying like, thanks, I just lost two hours uh, <laughs> flipping through these pages. Uh, oh, I guess I didn't link Beta List. But basically what beta list is, is a collection of beta products that you can go check out on a simple blog, sign up for these startups, and play with them. If you are a nerd like I am, that's something that I'm constantly doing. Who's on PATH? Anyone sign up for PATH? Fellow nerd. So we're trying these things out. Uh, Foursquare, we tried that, that's so a year and a half ago. Uh, all these things that we play with, um, I have all these apps that I'm constantly consuming, trying out, looking through the prism of journalism. Can I use this for journalistic storytelling? Uh, can I use it for reporting? Yes, no, moving on to something else. And Beta List is just about the collection of all these different startups that come up with, the, they all have awkwardly spelled name pro, uh, <laughs> products, usually around an animal that's really cute. Um, and you just sign up and you try them out. And that's what this is, it's emerging technology just no rhyme or reason, it's just some cool new thing, they put it up there, try it out. Um, these three different things are what uh, I was thinking in terms of uh, my project, Tech and Tools, which is just taking that collection of, of technology and looking at it in the prism of journalism, but taking the wisdom of the crowd to crowdsource, to put it into practice, to rate them, to decide whether they're useful, whether they're cool or not, um, things like that. And all my tools are free, uh, because that's the resources our newsrooms work under. Uh, free or damn cheap. I think I've limited to free on the current one. Um, so the goal for the product is to tap into that, to the harness of the community, like Carnival of Journalism, uh, to take the latest technology that's out there, like uh, Beta List, and then let people rate and play with the technology, like interactive narratives. Um, 
you know, make it a searchable database with diverse categories. With my flat page, the, the, the current state of the project, I have a category for audio, video, interactive, utilities, and miscellaneous, because some stuff is like, I don't know how to explain it, just go play with it and you'll get it. Um, we want, you know, very simple standard uh, uh, ratings. We want people to use the thing and talk about, you know, I give this four stars, or it's really <coughs> unstable, or it is really cool. Uh, different things to play with. <coughs> Rate it, rank it, so we can, again, crowdsource this stuff. Um, and then, I cannot do this alone, uh, and I know there are fellow nerds that are out there that are stumbling on these things. I, when I have 15 minutes of free time, because this is, a, I, like I said, I'm a nerd, I like Google things, stumble upon, and just see what tools are out there. Because there is no place outside of beta list that's really collecting emerging stuff. I'm going to South By, Southwest, uh, South By next week, bragging a little bit. Uh, but the reason I'm going is to learn about these emerging technologies before it hits mainstream. That's where Twitter launched. Uh, that's where uh, Gowalla is from. Um, so going to these places and then putting them to uh, a place where journalists can be exposed to them and start using them. Um, but I know I'm not alone in kind of geeking out in this way. So I want to kind of crowdsource and get people to submit things. Um, and then uh, we talked about this. There used to be a website, I'm forgetting what it was like, the dot com graveyard or something like that for all these big companies that died. It used to be a website that kind of showed what was. Um, I found that the best timeline app out there, and I always forget the name, uh, died because it didn't have a good business model. But uh, I want this database to be an accidental archive of these archive, uh, uh, of these applications that come and go. Uh, so you kind of put it into context. Oh, it's like that thing. Um, things like that. Like Vuvox is slowly dying, but I still believe in it. Um, <laughs> And I would want this to be, and I'm finding this to be more and more uh, something that's in demand. Um, Storify, who's heard of Storify? Right, everyone's heard of Storify. The White House used Storify. Mm -hmm. I get the claim that I met Bert uh, and he gave me a beta pass. So I got to play with Storify before. And he wanted people, journalists, tech journalists, web journalists to play with Storify so they could make it stronger and better. The goal is this community, like the Carnival of Journalism, comes together, tests something out, rates it, and puts it out there. And folks are going to be coming uh, to this community to give them a preview into this different technologies. So I, I, I have two goals for this project. One is to make my collection a lot more lively, a lot more crowdsourced, um, the rating of it, so you can keep, see examples of how this particular tool is being used. The other thing, which is in theory, really simple is this type of platform should be off the shelf that anyone can use. For example, I'm using this uh, a platform to rate my, um, to, 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 to show these different apps. I have a colleague who has a mobile toolkit and it's all Android and iPhone apps uh, that he gets hit up for and he points to a flat page, a blog entry that has a list of things. I have another colleague in New Mexico who has the Gorilla journalist guide, uh, which is a collection of stuff. This platform ideally is off the shelf that whatever collection you have that, that requires ratings, that requires you know crowdsourcing, this product will, will be that template for that. So I mean, there could be a, a site collecting interactive educational apps or gamification <coughs> for democracy. You can collect these, you start collecting these things in this infrastructure and present it in a much more engaging and definition type of way. Um, the status of our project is right here. Uh, Dale and I um, basically uh, sat down, and this is called wireframing. Um, and so we sketched out the home page and started brainstorming of different aspects of it. We know the features. We want the people, folks, to be able to submit something right away. We want people to uh, know that there's a featured tool inspired by Netflix, because so many things are. We've got the, uh, the ability to scroll and browse what's hot, what's new in different categories. We broke out the website and um, I mocked this up yesterday, uh, just showing an example of the category of audio tools. Put mouse over and put your mouse over these different tools and see what they're about. Uh, the featured thing, the carousel, which is standard. Talk about the featured tool of the month. 
uh, submitted, latest submitted thing. You can rate and rank and sort. All that good stuff that a solid database does. But it's all in the prism of, again, hijacking technology in the name of journalism and then making it accessible and useful to other journalists. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to call all this project Yelp.com for journalism. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so this last project here, uh, should I just tell sort of yeah, Doug's just, role you, and everything? So is was developed by someone named Doug McLaren. He couldn't be here right now because he's in New York City judging a certain newspaper competition. Um, uh, but he put together, he had an idea about um, uh, how to sort of create a more vibrant debate. And this really uh, struck me because I think one of the problems that we have is that we've got, in terms of journalism, we have this tremendous... Uh, technology at our fingertips, yet really for the most part, 90% of what we've done is we've taken your old analog dead tree newspaper and we've put it up on the computer. Uh, and so instead of the letters to the editor's column, you've got a comment section, but it kind of comes below, it's relegated to the bottom, and still it's a very traditional newspaper experience <coughs> for the most part. So Doug's idea was, well, how can we kind of just rip up the page as we've known it and create a different kind of user interface for people to engage with content so that the person who's, let's say, produced an article doesn't necessarily hog the stage, that the audience can really become part of that equation and part of that dialogue. And as soon as you do that and you start sort of experimenting with different ways, you realize that, you know, there's just a lot of different opportunities that emerge so that you don't have to have necessarily the same kind of linear uh, argument or linear discussion that you've had before, but things can really get meshed up and people can follow and create different uh, arguments, different storylines, etc. on the page. So he did that recently, and Sasha Anawal is going to explain sort of how he conceived of that. Right. So first of all, the, the exciting thing about this project is it's actually real. And what you're looking at right now is, is, is what happened, and we have Dale McDonald who's sitting over there waiting to thank. And um, the reason why, uh, one of the things that's interesting about arts journalism is that people have found that increasingly the way that arts are made and the way that journalists respond to arts and the way that you respond to arts is because you engage with them. And what's happening is instead of you sitting in the audience and I'm not going to sit on your lap, <laughs> but you might sit on mine. <laughs> um, is what's happening is that instead of being in the dark and looking at the stage and you know having the theater people tell you what you know do their play in front of you, you're actually now starting to be part of the performance. And so people, it's it's starting on low levels with crowdsourcing and doing Twitter, and you con conclude the play for somebody else or the dance or the opera. I have a friend who just called me about a musical. He said I'm never going to get a chance to write a musical. But if I crowdsource the musical and everybody gets to have a role in it, we'll actually create this musical. And what's happening now is more and more and more, it's getting to almost a level of complete do-it-yourself. So that it's like quilting. So arts are happening, we all sit down together, you quilt evenly to me, and we create this thing. So what, what's happened is that level of engagement comes because all of us expect it. We're used to it. We like to be engaged. And I know those are bu big buzzwords, but what Doug did was he, 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 he is trying to think about not just arts journalism, but journalism at large. Because what's happened is that when people have something to say about a story, they, you know, in the, in the traditional way, very few people would get their letters printed. So the question was, how can we kind of equalize the, com how can we do a different kind of storytelling? And, you know, this really is an experiment with engagement and participation. So they devised, with Dale and uh, Doug, devised a, di divided the page up into three equal columns. Um, you have a very, very simple question, which essentially was, should arts organizations and cultural organizations lead the audience, or should organizations pay attention to everybody who cares about it, who's in the audience, and follow? follow Twitter, follow, you know, so it's this very basic lead follow question. Deliberately a little bit confusing because what one of the things they found is that, so they set it up as three columns and these are all the people who are advocating for lead and these are all the people who are advocating for follow 
And these are all the readers. And there are three equal columns. This actually should probably be up equally level with this. This is an experiment. Um, <laughs> um, what they found was that the, the simpler the question, the more nuanced the answers. That's a really interesting thing, I think. Uh, they got in five days, um, 150 people responded in very big length. 22,000 people came. They have this community centimeter here so that you could watch how it was going up and down. And then also, from a practical point of view for the study of journalism, how much influence do, does voting have on other people and what they're thinking? Um, and then I'm just going to click on some. For me, myself, and I, not all of you know all of these people, maybe because they're arts writers. This is Michael Phillips, who used to be the uh, theater critic for the LA Times. Well, I mean, he's a great mind. He's a fabulous critic. I want to jump right on in and, and see what he has to say. Um, so I do. And Diane Ragsdale, she's a really interesting person. And here's Stephanie Barron, who's the curator for um, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And, you know, here, I'm getting to one of these. Just to show you, here's Kelly Tweedle, who I never knew before, but she's the executive director of uh, the Seattle Opera. Opera is something that's very exclusionary. What happens? She gets 42 comments. And when you go and look at them, here's her, her treatise. Um, they get very lovely, and if you, we are not going to take the time to read them right now. But if you do, the level of storytelling is so rich. And these are people coming from all over the place on these subjects. Um, most of the people, believe it or not, whether they voted for follow or leave, actually their arguments were sort of in between. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there was just a lot to learn about this and its applications. Really, I sort of think of it as taking newspaper journalism and kind of making it 3D, making it um, one of the great things with, I think, with arts journalism and the application of this is we still have the need to have people in the room together like this, and we still need to come together. It's how do you, for the arts, it's you're never going to get people to go to the arts if you can't move them and make them almost feel and touch and hear what it is to be live. So how do you make a newspaper live? And that's kind of the challenge. I think um, this went a long way toward that. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to also uh, thank Dale McDonald, who's the technical director of the Innovation Lab, who is kind of honchoing all this stuff, and uh, uh, none of it would happen without him. So we all owe him a tremendous debt. But let's, uh, 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 let's open this up to questions here to any of the people who presented projects. Um, uh, and I think just to comment on the last one, that I think it's just. You know, it, it's so simple, but if you change the user interface a little bit, you change the conversation. And this way allows you to kind of house so many different conversations under one banner, whereas before there'd kind of be basically a one-way conversation happening. So questions here from anyone? Don't hold back here. Brian? I have a question for uh, Andrew's presentation, which is who do you think your customer is? Is it the newspapers or is it the citizen journalists? Uh, it's a good question. I think probably our first set of folks are going to be working journalists because we found that uh, they they need the help. But uh, but I think the idea is that you could throw this to the masses and you could make just a generic footage call to anyone who self-identifies as a video maker and have them contribute good good content right away. And that's been a challenge for a lot of folks who have tried that experiment of let the masses create magic and they realize it's a lot harder. Than people. Other questions here? Please. Well, I actually had another question uh, along the lines because I know you said that it, it, it depended on the app for the for the video if it was going to be five shots or it could actually be expanded to seven, etc. Right. And um, I was just wondering about right now you have it for set up for the iPad as opposed right. to the iPhone, right? Well, it, it could go either way, but the iPad is more space to have a user interface. Yes. But that's if. But it almost seemed to me that it was, it was more like student-driven uh, because if you already are a working journalist, you're not going to need a reminder of the five shots. You already know what the shots you, are. You'd be shocked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I worked with four great professional, award-winning journalists in Beijing during Olympics and tried to teach them video journalism. 
when they're going out to far reaches of China and everything, and no matter how hard you train them, just there's so much in your brain when you're doing original reporting, unless it's muscle memory, you, you, you give them a checklist of 10 things, only two stick, yeah, and you're lucky if two stick. So I think having this baked into the app and say, you know, every moment that you're you know, in the process of doing video journalism, we're gonna give you either bumper guards, reminders, checklists, advice, feedback, I think that's really needed because uh, you know, 10 years of training folks trying to do this in the field, it's a tough thing. You know, and I'm pretty sympathetic to good reporters. My wife is one. So uh, <laughs> this is, you can see this as kind of like, okay, you don't have to listen to me, but listen to the app uh, and, and get them to do better video journalism. But this is all in terms of that you're actually collecting the video also with the iPad, right? Or would it be, because I mean, I don't know what the quality of the iPad video really would be right. in terms of maybe that would be okay for a web. Right. Um, right. But not necessarily for anything else. Yeah. And so I, I think if you wait two weeks, yeah, maybe right. one week, right? <laughs> iPad 3, in theory, should have a, a higher res camera. But you're right, the camera on this is really meant for video conferencing and not really for high quality video. But you might have the same 1080p HD camera that's in here right now, the uh, iPhone 4S, the next one. in this guy. And then that would be really interesting to see. Yeah, but you're right. Right there? Sorry, so just to go off of that. Sorry, did you say that that program you used for students in the class, or is that just well, the five shot method we've been using for students for the last few years. So, um, you know, we've got some of them here that have done the five shot, and uh, you know, it's it's something that we told them to bring this sheet of paper with them out in the field. Mm -hmm. This is the extent of the five shot right now in terms of how they apply it. I mean, because it's so much of reporting, or I mean, I've never worked with video before, but so much of it is intuitive, so it wouldn't surprise me that when you go out, there is so much in your mind, so it's like, how applicable or how, sorry, practical is it to go out and you're, you know, you're shooting and you're trying to figure out what, what elements of the story you want to capture, but at the same time, you're, you constantly have to think, you kind of have these reminders in your, in your face, I don't, I mean, how... Yeah, and that's where user testing is going to help. You're right. We have to find out what's the right balance of information overload. Like if we give you seven things you need to look out for in every shot, that's just going to glaze over, right? You're not going to be able to process all that. So a lot of user testing is going to have to be done in terms of how much is the right amount in the field to give instruction. But the, the hope is that if you do this five, seven, ten times in the field, it will, I won't, wouldn't say second nature, but it becomes more familiar to you so that you may not need all the same kind of beginner hints that you had before. But I find, you know, even when I've done, you know, dozens and dozens of stories before for web video, I still go back to this, this five shot method because I, you know, when you're in the heat of reporting and you've got to get an audio interview and photos and chasing that source down, sometimes you want things that make things simple. And I think that's what the method does. I have a question about the app for the, for the schools and the news. Is that something that will fit into, that they're allowed to incorporate into their curriculum? Does it fit with the standards? Because I think that you do need a captive audience if you want to get your kids engaged. But is it something that will ever be allowed in the foreseeable future? Yeah, that's why we, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I didn't plan it, but that's why we um, uh, partnered with Kids Voting USA. It's, uh, they're already in the classroom. So it's, uh, Kids Voting USA is a, it's like a national, it's like a, it's like the McDonald's of civics, but less bad for you. More <laughs> <laughs> because because they, they franchise. So school districts buy in to the Kids Voting USA curriculum, um, and then teachers use it. And we actually did a bunch of interviews with um, teachers who work in, in the curriculum. And there is, the, and the problem is with No Child Left Behind, the, the, the window for civics has shrunk and shrunk. So we decided to go in with an organization that's already in with teachers who said, because it'll be implemented as part of their curriculum, they said they could use it and give credit for it. And they like it because it, they can do part of it in class and most of it out of class, right? So that actually was really appealing to, to the teachers. And that's why we chose the cities we chose, the newspapers we chose, because they have really, really strong um, kids voting in the programs as well. Yeah, no, that's really important. If you don't make them play, leave them up. Uh, with that, what grade levels would you be targeting? Um, they'll be high school students, mostly 10th through 12th. Mm -hmm. um, on your lead and follow, it seems like you were able to get a really high caliber of people participating and really good, deep interaction in a really <coughs> good time. What was the spark that brought all these people to that, that place? 
And most of them, um, Doug McLennan, who put this together, knew, he knows them, uh, many of them. And uh, it, you know, the world of arts organizations and so forth is fairly small. And those who, every single arts organization right now is facing the how do we, how do we get more audience issue and how do we balance marketing with also substance and these these sort of the perplexity of, of what does social media mean and how do we use it and are we using it the right way. So they wanted to know the answer equally as they wanted well. to know the answer equally. <laughs> and they they're looking at they're looking at funding, they're looking at the bottom line, they're looking at all sorts of things. And it's a, it's a fairly small community nationally. Um, what's interesting is that journalists are asking the same questions that they are. Do we have time for one more question? There is one? No? Oh, Brian, go ahead. For Robert, uh, on, your, on your site right now, did you say, is it an app or is it going to be a website? Or is it going to be? The, it's currently a website and it'll probably be a searchable database. It's more, um, you can query it more. Right now it's just alphabetically organized by the logos and then category, uh, categorized by the different types. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, is a place that really kind of welcomes ideas that you might have and the project you might want to work on and, and also a place to kind of collaborate with people that you otherwise might not come to collaboration with. So keep that in mind. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah.